that's a good uh, introduction to um, our new soil health extension instructor who uh, Courtney Cousin is replacing Jackie Jamison um, in the joint NRCS University of Idaho soil health position. She just turned on her camera. One of the things that she's gonna be working on is kind of helping to make those resources more visible um, to everyone because right now a lot of the, the videos and the resources uh, are hidden in the university system. Um, on YouTube. Do you want to say hi, Courtney? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm yeah, super excited to meet a bunch of you and work to get these resources uh, more available and more accessible. So yeah, very excited. Courtney is currently based in Boise at the Water Center, um, but will be traveling quite a bit to the Magic Valley area. My name is Sean Neal. I'm the state soil scientist for NRCS Idaho, and uh, welcome to our Idaho 5 for 5 Soil Health Roundtable. This is a virtual workshop where presenters have five minutes to present on a soil health topic. We have five minutes or less and five slides or less, and uh, we have uh, six folks lined up to talk with us today, and after they're done, we'll open it up for a general uh, question and answer, answer session. And uh, people are encouraged to, to ask questions. Um, while the presenters, so that we can get through the, the, the six, and I know five minutes seems like it'll go by awful fast, but if you can hold your questions until the end, it'll make, it'll make it so that we can, we can have a, a, a better discussion. Um, and if somebody's mentioned something that you're just burning to ask a question about, just jot it down and and, uh, and, and please bring it up um, after the presenters have spoken. Um, with us today, we've got a wide variety of folks, topics, and uh, that represent a fantastic array of uh, agricultural experience. And um, I think this, is, uh, this should be very interesting. I'd like to start us off today uh, hearing from uh, Mr. Bradley Johnson with the Nature Conservancy. And uh, I'll just let him take it from there. All right, I will <clears throat> share the screen quick. Okay, everybody seeing that? Is, okay, Linda's gave me a thumbs up, so I guess I'll get going. So thanks, Neil, for putting, or Sean, for putting me First in the list, that's unnerving. <laughs> so I am Brad Johnson, I'm with the Nature Conservancy. Today I'm going to talk about two projects that we have been working on for a while. Uh, increased organic matter, higher water infiltration rates, and reduced cost of production are the goals for both of these farms. The uh, first one I'll talk about, we focus more on the cover crops used and what was gained from them. The second is how this farmer used a perennial crop as a cover crop and basically an intercrop kind of at the same time. Uh, but to start, I have a quick question to ask the group. Which one of these soils do you want? The soil on the left has been no-tailed for several years, and this picture was taken during the first year of a successful cover crop. Soil on the right has had no cover crop and intensive tillage. That soil doesn't allow much doesn't allow for much root penetration or water infiltration, and there's a serious lack of biology in the soil. So they have to rely heavily on expensive synthetics for it to produce well. Um, on the left, the microbiology is revving up on this soil, and that'll help feed those plants and reduce the need for these high-priced synthetic inputs that we have nowadays. So we'll go to the second slide. All right, so this one is our PNC Kimberly demonstration farm. Uh, we are working with Todd Ballard on 30 acres of his farm. We're, yeah, we're operating the demo farm. Todd does all the work for us. Uh, Todd's been no-tailing this field for a few years and has been experimenting with cover crops for several years in different fields. The soil on the left in the previous slide is this very field right here. Our goal is to test different soil health practices 
and share that with other producers and industry people in Idaho. This here on this slide is a picture of one of the seven different cover crop mixes that we planted this summer. Simplot has provided the cover crop seed, crop inputs, and, soy, and a soil moisture probe for this project. Uh, I'll share the data from the soil moisture probe during a workshop this winter. We haven't compiled all the data quite yet. Um, need to look at it a little bit more before I know what we're looking at. Um, so after harvest, we irrigated this field and no-tailed in the cover crop into some pretty heavy malt barley residue. Uh, this, winter, this winter, what's that? Sure. Are you talking to me yet or is that? No, I'm. Uh, this winter we plan on grazing this cover crop with sheep. And in the spring, we planned on planting sugar beets with a mixture of no till in part of the field and strip till in the other part. But because we had some raptor sprayed on the beans last year, we've got a 18 month, 20 month plant back period. So we've got a figure out what we'll plant for next year. We're gonna wait and see what this weather does, see how much snow we get, see what our water picture looks like for next year before we decide what to plant. We may have to go for a lower water using crop. Uh, so this slide, I'll just run through some of the cover crop mixes that Simplot provided for us. Uh, I don't have time to go through them all, but I did put three in here that I liked and one that I thought didn't work very well. Uh, some of the other blends that I didn't include in here included uh -oh. why. So, so on your compost. Uh... <laughs> uh, anyway, some of these did include rye. I didn't add these in here because for lack of time, but I'm kind of excited to see how the rye works and then look into next year to see what our management practices will have to be to make sure that doesn't become a weed on us. Um, I th think my takeaway with all these cover crop mixes is the more species you have, the better. Not only does this benefit the soil more by adding more diverse microorganisms, microorganisms into the soil, but what I found is if one or two of those species fail for whatever reason, you still have some others growing in there. So uh, strip one is Simplot's winter forage mix as winter peas, oats, winter barley, winter wheat, rutabagas, and turnips. Um, this one did seem to do well. The peas and the rutabaga, rutabaga and the turnip all are still actively growing. They were pretty thick in the field. Uh, for whatever reason, I didn't see a lot of oats. I'm not sure why that happened, but this mix, uh, the purpose of this one is mainly diversity and winter cover and forage for critters if you're going to graze. Uh, there's not a lot of nitrogen being created with this one, which is kind of a bummer. I'd like to see that. Strip two is the budget mix. This is the one that I, I feel kind of failed. It only has triticale and buckwheat in it. Um, and I did not see a lot of buckwheat, which kind of goes along with, I planted some in Rexburg two years ago. It didn't grow very well there either. I think we maybe planted it too deep. It's probably a planting issue. It should grow here. Um, this one, I just there's not enough diversity in it um, because of that buckwheat not growing. There's just not a lot of growth in that strip. Strip three is by far my favorite mix that Simplot has. It's called their pollinator mix. It's crimson clover, common vetch, master white mustard white clover and phacelia. Uh, all species in this one did very well. Uh, there's lots of nodules in the roots. So we're producing some, some nitrogen by the vetch and the clovers. Uh, and the phacelia was amazing. You could dig it up and you could just see that mycorrhizae in there, the, the web looking structures. Uh, the clover is there, it's slower growing, but it is pretty thick in the ender in the down on the ground level in the inside the canopy. Um, I feel our soil health gains were the biggest with this mix just because of that diversity and the the legumes that are in it. 
uh, in the spring, I'll do a PLFA test and Haney test to see if my hypothesis on this one is true. Strip five was their soil health number one mix. Uh, winter peas, triticale, common vetch, and radish. This one also performed pretty well. Um, we're creating some nitrogen in there. There's enough diversity in it to ramp up the microbiology in the soil. Um, it is helping with soil permeability and the soil structure. And you can see that when you stick shovel in the dirt. Um, but I'd also like to point out that Todd and I both agree Top growth is good because it covers the soil and yeah, basically keeps that soil covered, reduces the erosion, but really what's important is your root growth underneath. That's where the magic happens with all these cover crops. Um, I mentioned the, the moisture. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of what we're doing on the demo farm this year. I would like to thank Simplot employees, uh, Ian Crawford, Shannon Learman, and Cody Kramer for their help. Ian was, he helped me a lot with different practices we we're doing. Shana managed the moisture probe and is compiling that data for us. And Cody Kramer sent out all these different cover crop blends. Uh, anyway, moving on to our next project. This one I'm calling the Grandview Intercrop. Uh, if everybody knows Grandview, whoa, what is that all about? Okay, if anybody knows the climate in Grandview, it is very warm there, warm throughout the summer. But with that said, I do think that this would work well in the Magic Valley. It maybe wouldn't be as productive as Grandview, but it could be. So <clears throat> with this one, this farmer has grown Timothy hay for the export market and grazed that Timothy through the winter for many years. He was wanting to add more forage to the winter grazing program while adding plant diversity into the system. So last year with the help with help from TNC to basically pay back any losses, some losses if he encouraged some, he decided to plant to try a corn and Timothy intercrop cover crop. The goals of this were to increase soil health, stabilize his sandy ground and increase grazing days during the winter, all while increasing his profits. This farm does get manure applied at the appropriate times, but has not had any synthetic phosphorus or potassium applied in the last 25 years in the time that he's owned it. And is a, nitrogen is applied through the pivots. And the farm, overall farm, has an average of 300 to 320 bushel corn each year. Uh, hey Brad, so, yes. I don't. Um, oh wait. Never mind. Um, <laughs> well, you're kind of getting, you know, five for five. Oh, am I getting long? But you also have two projects, so maybe it was ten minutes. Maybe it was a miscommunication oh. on our part. No, no, I didn't think this would be five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, can I just run through this last slide real quick? You can. Okay. Okay. So just to kind of give you an overview of what he has done in 20, 2020, he had alternating rows of corn and peas no-tilled into the Timothy while the Timothy was still growing. We had 370 head days per acre of grazing on that. And then in 2021, this year, Timothy was still there. He no-tilled in a full season corn. That corn yielded 295 bushels to the acre and he'll be grazing it all winter long. Uh, so I had a lot more to say about that one, but. I ran over. You should talk about this one in the next, uh, in the next five for five. Yeah. I usually for talk sure. faster. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It really is. Um, <laughs> but we do want to keep to the spirit of five for five. <clears throat> okay. And we, we have uh, Justin Place up next to talk to us about no-till farming. All right, so uh, as has been said, um, my name is just I uh, Hamer area. It's about 30 miles north of Idaho Falls in East Idaho here, the Jefferson County area. And uh, we grow barley and wheat and mustard and alfalfa.
pilot program in 2015 with uh, one pivot and we wanted to see how this was going to work and uh, so in 2015 like i said we put that, that on there then in 2016 we went with the whole farm and went ahead with it all um, the reason we were looking at it is we were trying to conserve our topsoil and water. And about that same point in time, uh, you know, if, for those over in this area in the Snake River Aquifer Plain, uh, we, we were tasked to cut back by about 15% on the water. And uh, so we did that, uh, or that was part of our plan. In our usual field here, we're, we're always running the the uh, the water in the spring of the year to try to tie things down so that um, I want to kind of this is kind of where we uh, where we normally would start our spring out at and I'm hoping you can see this um, this was actually in the fall of, of uh, 2020. And, you know, as, as people look at it, you think, well, we are, uh, you know, the bottom, bottom screen there looks similar to the Dust Bowl. And uh, that's, that's the way Hamer looks every spring and every fall when the wind blows and the crops are out of the field and the, and the dirt's all worked. Um, so what we, what we did is we went back to uh, the no-till program, or we went and we looked at the no-till program uh, here's here's a just an example of what we're pulling. Uh, we we like to ban liquid fertilizer in front of our drills. Uh, it's a it's a phosphate, pretty phosphate uh, high blend that uh, just gives a little punch to get things going. But uh, I've also done some no-till for uh, a friend of mine about 30 miles away. He's not in the sand, and uh, when we do that, he doesn't do the liquid fertilizer like we do. And so when we do that, uh, I just take the drills only out there and, uh, and we'll drill. But as you can see, we, we leave a lot of residue on the top. And, and uh, we found with the residue, uh, we have to, that starts, the control on the residue starts in the fall with the combines. Uh, this, this particular field is a mustard field, uh, or it's following mustard, planting barley into it last year. Uh, the, the residue on top with mustard stands really well. If you knock the, knock the, the crop product over, as you can see in the tracks down in here, the, um, it makes a mat that you cannot really drill through very easily. And so it, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge there. So the, the other then there was a lot of added benefits to us as we as we went water and the soil erosion. We came, you know, here's a sample of dirt that we pulled. We just dug it. And as you can see, if you look here, there's there's worms, earthworms in here doing the job. Uh, they're stirring that soil for us. Uh, we've got a lot of biomass up on the top. This this field was actually in barley. It went barley. Barley, then it was back in barley again. And so you can see the, the crop residue in there is, is the way it is. Um, we've got, it is a very sandy soil and uh, we, we just don't blow or move that much. Um, with that much organic material on top, it'll help us retain the moisture and therefore we can cut back on, on how much water we're using. Um, one thing that it's done is it saved us a lot of trips across the field. Um, and when you, when you figure uh, trips across the field is uh, one of those things that, that adds up. And uh, the, the first thing we noticed is all of a sudden our fuel usage was about half of what we'd been using under full conventional tillage. Um, with that, less fuel usage is equal to less tractor hours and less tractor hours is more dollars in your pocket for the for the production that you're doing uh, we have less manpower to do the job also 
and uh, it, it's really then in the other part of the the, the other one that, that we really fight in the spring is blowout and uh, with the sand blowing like like in the video clip we uh, would we would lose that uh, that good uh, good planting time and uh, you know we'll blow out and then you have to go back in and replant so then you're back in there you're using more fuel you're running more hours and you're planting more seed and and sometimes you'd plant two or three times before you finally establish a crop and these are just kind of a couple of samples i got i've got this side as a mustard here on the left uh it's growing right in that residue uh, the barley as you can see on the right side has uh really done well it just grows up you grow above the old canopy grows out it's a beautiful crop so i guess the the take-home message that i have here is is that's what we've done it worked on my, my farm it's been a it's been a tremendous benefit for us on the uh with the no-till program and uh i leave that with you with one with one caveat, if you look right here, this in this sandstorm, if you look right in this area, there's a tractor and a cart and a backhoe, and they're not that far away from me. And as you can see, they kind of disappear into the into the sandstorm as well. So anyway, um, that's all. I have. Thank you, thank you, Justin. That was really that was really excellent. And before we let you off the hook, can you tell us real? quick how long you've been no-tilling? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, we, uh, we started no-tilling in 2015 and uh, with one pivot. And it killed my dad. He, he really didn't like the, the, the no-till idea. You know, he was old school, get a lot of tillage equipment out there and really work that ground. So the first pivot we did was a was an alfalfa pivot that we had uh, taken. We killed it chemically, killed it in the fall of the year, and he wanted to work it all up. And I told him, I said, Dad, we're not going to tear this up. We're just going to till it. And and that wasn't the plan, you know, for him. It took him till about February. Finally, I told him, I said, Okay, I've got a plan. He says, Because he says you need a plan to do this. I said, Okay, here's my plan. In the spring of the year, we're going to hook up the disc. And he thought that was a great idea. And then uh, I said, we're, once we get the disc hooked up, we're gonna go out there and disc in the wheel track so that we can drill it without bouncing on wheel tracks. That's a good plan. I says, then we're gonna plant it. And he didn't think that was too good idea. So our number one acre on the farm to watch that year was uh, right along the road. He would drive up there at the time. He was, he was about 76 years old and he drove up there and he'd get out of his pickup and he'd go over there and he'd get on his knees and dig in the sand to see what he had and, and at that point in time uh that's when that's when he realized all of a sudden this is pretty good and when we got in there in the fall of the year we were combining he said you know you can do this crappy farming any day you want he says because yields look yields look great for what we did um with that i will also say on our yield side of things we had one year of a yield drag until we kind of started getting our stuff figured out what we were really doing. And uh, when we, once we did that, I, I just pulled the yield, last five year yield data, we're actually one bushel higher than we were for the previous five before we started no-till. So it, it's, we're, we're saving money. It's in the end, it's all about, it's all about uh, price per bushel. You know, on our farm, a bushel of barley or a bushel of wheat cheaper without doing all the tillage produce more bushels or the same bushels i'm going to put more in my pocket absolutely all right well thank you thank you that was excellent um next up we have mary wolf with the pmc to talk to us about uh, cover crop rate trials take it away mary um good morning everybody can you hear me okay sounds great okay good so uh, at the Aberdeen Plant Materials Center right now, we're working on ways to make planting cover crops more economical. And in our region, in the Intermountain West, there's currently a wide range of recommended seeding rates for each cover crop species. 
And this lack of precise rates can end up being a barrier to producers adopting cover crops because if they plant too little seed, they can end up with a sparse stand and that's going to provide little benefit in terms of soil protection, soil health, or livestock forage. And then if they plant too much seed, that's expensive, especially when a lower seeding rate would have provided a similar benefit. So this summer, the Aberdeen PMC established the first year of a two-year field trial to evaluate four seeding rates of each of eight different cool season cover crops. And we've got barley, triticale, wheat, oat, turnip, radish, hairy vetch, and winter pea. And the goal of this study is to find optimal single species seeding rates for our area, which can then be used to plan an economical cover crop seed mix using a, a cover crop mix calculator. And for the next several years, our PMC is going to be working on various cover crop rate trials. So we have another year for this study that I'm going to talk about, and then we'll continue doing other cool season and some warm season species as well to dial in the rates for those. There we go. So um, this table shows the cover crop species varieties and then the four seeding rates of each that we planted this year on August 24th. Um, I had hoped to get it planted earlier, like right after wheat harvest, but it kept raining and raining and raining. So um, looking at these rates, if you've looked at various sources for how much cover crop to plant, so for example, um, the PMC Tech Note 67, which is about cover crops for the Intermountain West, or if you've looked at Green Cover's website or various extension publications, you've noticed that there's a wide range of suggested seeding rates for each species. So in our study, what we did was we set out to bracket that range of rates. Um, so to go a little bit higher on the highest seeding rate, and a little bit lower on the lowest seeding rate. So for each of the eight species, we planted four rates and we did four replications of each rate. And as far as evaluations go, we know exactly how many seeds per acre we planted. And at one month, we counted the population. So, um, counted some rows and took that out to population. So we know what population we had. And we're doing monthly evaluations of canopy cover and plant height. We evaluated biomass at two months after planting. And also we got growth stage at that time. And we're gonna do more biomass evaluations at termination. And for turnip, radish, and oat, terminations already happened. It happened at about three months after planting when they winter killed. And the rest of the crops will be terminated by us at the end of April. And we're going to plant this same study next August at a different site so that we have two site years of data for these cover crops. So I'd like to talk a little bit about canopy cover and how that's working out. Um, here's some early results. So, um, and the picture up on top is an example of how we're evaluating canopy cover. I take photos looking down at the canopy, which is the, the green one on the, on the left. And then I run those through the Canopio app to get percent cover. And what that app does is any green pixels in the photo are converted to white and all the other colors are converted to black. And then the app calculates the percentage of white pixels and that tells you percent cover. And the example in the photo is turnip at one month after planting. And that's at the second lowest rate, which was four pounds an acre. So at one month after planting, it already had 73% cover. Um, the one drawback to this method of estimating the canopy is that you have to hoe the weeds out. Because uh, the app only sees green versus not green. However, this is much easier than doing point intercept measurements on 128 plots, so I love it. So for the graphs, um, I'm hoping you can see those okay. Barley's on the left, turnips on the right. For each graph, 
A is the lowest seeding rate and D is the highest rate for that species. And each graph compares the canopy cover at one month after planting and at two months after planting. So notice how at one month after planting, the lower seeding rates have less cover than the higher seeding rates. But by two months after planting, the differences have pretty much evened out for these two species anyway, and all of the rates have reached over 90% cover. And this turned out to be similar for the other species, except for peas and vetch. So by two months after planting, radish and the other small grains all had at least 70% cover at all seeding rates. And this is just, you know, one year, but right now I would say, so unless you need immediate protection of the soil surface, the highest rates might not be worth the extra cost of planting. And then um, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about veg and peas right now because you know they're slow to establish and by two months after planting, even at the highest rates, they had less than 25% cover. In so, the spirit of five for five, uh, you have maybe like 30 more seconds. Oh, okay. So here is biomass at two months after planting. Um, I hope you can see that okay. And you'll notice that the highest seeding rates really didn't produce more biomass. And in the case of oats and turnip, they actually produced less. And what's next for this study? We'll keep doing the monthly measurements of canopy cover and height. We will measure biomass again at termination. And then we will be determining optimal single species seeding rates by crunching all the numbers at the end of the study. And um, we'll, we're going to publish a final study report and I'll be doing additional presentations for these events. And this, what's really cool is this data is also going to be used by the NRCS Technology Support Center staff to refine the erosion models that um, NRCS planners use, such as WEPS and Russell 2, so that the models will better estimate the soil protective effects on cover crops in a crop rotation. And awesome. thanks. Thank you, much appreciated. All right, um, good stuff, Mary. Uh, moving on, we'll be hearing from Mr. Tyson Meeks from Meeks Farms. Tyson. All right, I guess that's me. All right. All right, let's get rolling here. Is that showing up just right? Looks good. All right. So yeah, I am Tyson Meeks. I run a row crop farm down in uh, Southwest Idaho, the Treasure Valley region. When uh, Sean conscripted me for this here event, he reminded me of uh, tinkered with a lot of these concepts as far as cover crop, no-till, brought some cattle in on some ground. And uh, our latest adventure has been uh, composting. And I wanna highlight this because it doesn't seem to get a lot of traction in a lot of these meetings, primarily because most compost operations are involve a lot of uh, waste management, high volumes, and it's uh, really a whole nother level. But I've been using uh, Dr. David Johnson's technique here. And as the photo shows, that's one of his piles that sits on a standard pallet. It's about five feet tall. Um, and it's cheap and it's easy. It's all made out of construction materials thing costs about 30 bucks to make and you get to use it over and over and over again and it doesn't take a whole lot of special materials to fill it whatever you got laying around leaves straw old hay it's a great way to clean up small piles in your barnyard but pretty much anything goes to fill it not a big deal exactly what you use and so these bioreactors are easy to move around. They're on a pallet, get a forklift, put them in the shop in the winter time, put them in the shed in the summer so they don't get too hot. Um, they're real convenient and easy to work with. And once you get them filled up, you just leave them. You water them every couple of days so they don't get dried out, but otherwise there's no turning, no monitoring, no probing, no screwing around. So for a small operation like ours, that's a big deal because we just don't have the manpower to go tinker with these things every day for a couple hours. The one major downside is once you build a pile, they suggest that what you let it sit for up to a year to let the various microbial populations take hold and establish. 
So it is somewhat of a time delay getting started, but it seems to be well worth it. And one of these small bioreactors, even though we're putting it on extremely heavy, according to Dr. Johnson, we're getting 100 acres out of one of these little piles. Dr. Johnson says one of these things will cover five to 600 acres. So they're very scalable. They can really cover a lot of ground. So uh, once we get the compost made, then we got to figure out how to handle this stuff. So this is where we wash the compost. Um, as you can see, it's a real high dollar investment to get this stuff completed. Um, but we're trying to get the, the microbes from a solid medium being the compost into a liquid medium, basically a water carrier that we can handle easier. Because the, the suggested application rate for this compost is something like one pound of dry material per acre. So as you can imagine, that would be very hard to do in a dry setting. So essentially how this whole system works is we'll put the dry compost into this mesh bag here, shove the water hose in it that has a spray nozzle on it, just kind of start agitating everything around. All the carbon compounds and the microbes will come out in the water. They'll flow over the top of the five gallon bucket into that blue bucket, which has a big hole in the bottom. It's basically just an oversized funnel. And then we collect everything in the 250 gallon IBC tote there. It's kind of fun watching this stuff when we start washing it. The first 30 seconds or something, when we turn the water on, that compost extract just comes out as like super black coffee. It's real thick and dark colored. And as you keep washing, it gets a little bit lighter and lighter and lighter. And we figure about the time it reaches kind of iced tea color, we figure we've got most of the good stuff out of it. So we toss out whatever solid materials are left and fill it up and go again. And we can wash a 250 gallon tote in like half hour, 45 minutes. So it really goes pretty quick. So once we get the material into liquid form, um, there's some handling components to this that makes it easier. The extract itself, since it's in a, the microbes are dormant and we haven't added any foodstuffs to them, they'll actually sit in that water solution, that extract form for up to a week if you kind of keep it out of the sun and in decent storage. So if you got a rainy day, that's a great time to wash out several totes before you hit the planter and really rock and roll with the stuff. We use uh, centrifugal pumps to both get the material from the totes into the tractor and then again on the tractor to get it applied through the planter. They tend to chew up the microbes a little bit, but again, it's something cheap and easy and available as far as handling stuff. Um, some of the scientists recommend using either diaphragm or piston pumps to kind of mitigate some of that microbial damage, but we're putting, on, putting it on four or five times thicker than suggested. We figure we're still getting a useful application rate. Um, when it comes to the material itself, at some point it needs to be screened because there's always particulates that get through the washing process and it'll plug up your spray nozzles or um, fertilized orifices. You can put it through a 50 mesh screen, um, but figure on having to clean that screen quite a lot. It'll collect a lot of those carbon particles and um, just kind of cause problems for you. So we figured out a 30 mesh screen works real well. We can run basically every time we reload, which is about 500 gallons of product, we'll just drop out the main filter, clean it out real quick, takes two minutes, put it back in, we're good to go again. So. That has been a real key factor for us. Um, so this picture is a shot of our row crop planter. Right down here at the bottom between the wheels, there's a little orange tab with the tiny hose on it. That's how we dribble the compost extract right into our seed furrow. Um, and it's before the closing wheels, which are those spiked wheels are on the right side. This puts the microbes right down there where they can help those seedlings get going probably even before they come out of the seed really they'll probably infect that seed piece and kind of help stimulate the process um, on a row crop setting and because we're trying to establish higher microbial populations as fast as we can we're using 20 gallons per acre of this compost extract trying to really push the envelope and 
get that stuff going as quick as we can. Plus the high volume of water we're using really helps uh, with our application equipment, lets you use larger orifices, and helps push some of those ar larger particles out of the way. You have about 15 more seconds, Tyson. All right, perfect. Well, I just want to get to the results here. So this is a couple corn seed pieces. The one on the left is from our field where we're using the compost. I'm hoping you can see this colony of my um, fungal strands right here. And if we were to dig up that seed piece, the roots would just be covered with pear roots, as opposed to this conventional seed piece here on the right from a neighbor's field. As you can see, it's pretty much just that main feeder root sticking down there. Um, and yeah, that soil is just relatively lifeless by comparison. So we feel like this really gives our crops a good start on life. And it's really become the backbone of our soil health efforts because it works on any crop rotations. You don't need a long growing season in the fall or anything to establish a covered crop. So it's very adaptable. So there's some information for myself as well as Dr. David Johnson who put all this stuff together. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for you. Excellent, thank you, Tyson. Much appreciated. Um, next up in our uh, list is uh, Cooper Brassi talking about uh, no-till organic bean production in Southern Idaho. Cooper, do we have you with us? Hey, good morning, everybody. All right, morning, Cooper. Let me get started here, bear with me, please. All right, we've got your screen, not in presenter mode, but I can see you. Right, how about that? Perfect. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending today. I'm, I'm Cooper Brassi. I'm very pleased to have a chance to share with you real quick uh, some of the highlights of some work we've been doing to test no-till production system as applied to edible dry bean production. My dad, Fred, and our friends, Rich and Jennifer, are really happy to, to share this with you. Um, also, right out of the gate, I want to acknowledge support from the Nature Conservancy to uh, keep, us, uh, keep us going on this. It's, it is challenging, and we really appreciate their, their encouragement and support. So I, I want to say that, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of room for incorporating additional soil health practices into driving production in Idaho. Uh, the picture here, you can see a combine cruising along on some, some bare earth, some highly disturbed ground, you know, and if that's what all the 55,000 acres of, of edible beans that were harvested this year look like, then there's, there's a lot of space for an opportunity to um, keep the ground covered and, and grow some things after harvest or, or even work into a no-till or limited till situation like we're trying to, to test. Our approach is to try to grow, go grab all the uh, off the shelf Idaho legal short season pinno varieties we can find and try them. We are uh, roller crimping standing cereal rye and planting into it, or we're planting green into standing rye and roller crimping after that. So the roller crimper terminates the rye and then um, hopefully, you know, we, we calm down and pray a little bit and then Luckily, sometimes things come out of the ground and we, we start monitoring for stand um, and germination success and emergence, keeping track of soil moisture um, and soil temperatures. And then in the midpoint of the season, we do some soil health testing. You can see Nicholas Waters here from NRCS on the left and Brad Johnson on the right. And things go okay, we'll grow some beans with enough pods on them to swath them and then thrash them. So, the important thing about these pictures, if you can see my cursor here, is that you know there's no bare ground in this whole system. And that is a big change from previous approaches on our farm and, and certainly in the region. So it, it does present some challenges. This year, our results on the four pinot varieties we tested range and clean yield from about nine sacks to 16 sacks per acre. The leader here, the winner is Max Pinto, which you can see on the photo on the left. Um, 
All these varieties did suffer some pretty severe frost damage uh, on September 3rd and 4th, which is really frustrating for us. They're pretty high cleanouts of about 20%, which most of which we attribute to, to frost damage. You can see the, the yellow and orange beans in this photograph represent frozen beans that didn't finish in the pod. Uh, we also have these soil uh, health test results that we're chewing on this winter and we'll probably need some consultation and, and advice from quite a few of you experts who are listening to, to make sense of some of that. It is a little puzzling for us, but uh, we do have some baseline data now to move forward with on these no-till fields from the long term. So we, we do have challenges to overcome and questions to continue to answer here. Uh, firstly, on the left, you know, we, we know we're planting in a cold soil environment compared to till bare open ground. This soil that we're planting into just doesn't warm up as fast, so we're planting later. Uh, the ground is also firmer than a conventionally tilled, you know, soft soil environment. And where we we're farming in Shoshone, you know, we have these early season frosts sometimes, and so frost susceptibility is really an issue uh, in this field, particularly this year, which was very aggravating. You know, as I say, September 3rd and 4th, we had a, a frost where a couple hundred yards away, we had a field of potatoes that didn't get touched at all. So all we can think is that we have such a thick vegetative mat, both living and dead, that the soil is just insulated with this blanket. And so overnight when it gets cool, you know, the soil can't radiate heat and keep the plants warm for light frost protection. Now there may be some issues with rye allelopathy here, influencing beans and sort of stunting their growth. Um, we certainly want the rye to, for its allelopathic potential to suppress weed growth, but we're, you know, there is some work out there on, on interaction between cereals and, and beans and, and we're following that. And then, you know, we're continuing to work on how best to kill the rye. Here you can see in this photograph, this rye regrew after it was uh, crimped and, and smashed. Um, moving into 2022, we're planning to lower crimp some winter spelt and see what that can do for us. And we're going to try some other varieties, including uh, Rattler, Island, and Max, probably again, since that was our leader. And also the UC Southwest Red, which is an heirloom soup bean, which we think has a lot of potential in this. And as we go, we're keeping track of what we're doing to try to consider if we should develop a full-blown breeding program to develop beans that are best suited, you know, specifically suited to these conditions. To support that effort, we think we might pursue asking for grant funding from Western SARE, the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and NRCS conservation grants maybe. But we wanna ask you today if there's other sources of funding you think uh, might be applicable to this and you think could help us out in the long run. So again, thank you to the Nature Conservancy, Brad Johnson, who spoke earlier, and Neil Crescenti. I know you're both listening. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for the Nature Conservancy support. And I also need to thank a bunch of folks who don't have really time to, to mention here who have held our hand and, and keep us encouraged to keep going. And thank all of you for listening. I really want to thank you in advance for feedback that hopefully you'll give us. You can reach me, me here, uh, Cooper. I'm here at Earnings Organics, and you can email Rich at Earth Gnosis. Thanks, guys. Great, thank you, Cooper. A lot of lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving, a lot of moving parts and things to consider. Um, really, really interesting. Um, so, and I'm sure you're going to have uh, some some questions later on. I know I've got a couple for you. Um, moving right along, um, we'll be talking with uh, Cleve Smith, or he'll be talking to us. Um, and uh, Cleve is joined by. Uh, David maybe our district conservationist out of Burley. And, um, all right, we're getting a screen. It's not the presenter screen, but I can see you. Okay, Sean, does that look good? Yeah, you got it. Okay, so I'll do a brief introduction here. Um, Mr. Cleve Smith with us. He produces dry land organic wheat on 2,600 acres in Southern Idaho out in the sublet area. Uh, he's been farming for 69 years and has been raising organic wheat for the last 20. And he has always practiced conservation principles and he's willing to share some of those thoughts with us. And I'm just gonna throw in there, Cleve has been, he's been fun to work with. He's always got great ideas um, and uh, he's always seeking for the next, you know, the next big thing. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Cleve. This year, dryland farming was well named. If someone don't know about that verbiage, what we try to do is raise a crop 
with only the water that comes from the clouds, sometimes real challenging. As we experienced one of the worst droughts in 40 years this past year, and we have experienced three droughts in 60 years, we averaged about 50% of our crop yield. We usually get about 11 to 13 inches of rain, but this was a different year, and we only got about half that amount. Even with a normal rainfall, our experiments have proved it's not enough for annual cropping. Therefore, we let the ground rest for a year to build up in nutrients and replace the deep reservoir of moisture from the previous winter and to eliminate a crop of weeds because in organic farming, you can't use any chemicals. So in a fallow crop rotation, we must do everything we can to protect the soil from erosion, especially in the fallow year, such as number one, building dams in the bottom of the hollows. We have built 130 to 140 dams on 2,600 acres. The important thing is to build them gradual enough so you can farm over them. These have been built with a crown. <clears throat> so there's a natural spillway on each side that leaves the sediment in the basin. Something else you can do is to strip the crop soil, the topsoil off of the basin area, build the berm and replace the soil. I build these in two to three hours with a cat and a dozer. Number two, 21 miles of crossfield diversions have been built to control water erosion, and they are great for setting up strip cropping. Also built gradual enough to farm over. Number three, strip cropping is a wonderful practice to stop erosion of both wind and water. And another benefit I didn't realize until just recently, it makes a great fire guard. Number four, split slope is a fairly new practice, but has proven itself to be of value on steep side hills, especially for water erosion. This would make half of the side hill in fallow and half in crop. Number five, stubble mulch, which means leaving as much stubble on top as you can, especially during the fallow year. Helps preserve the winter moisture and helps against water and wind erosion. Also valuable in the crop following the fallow year. I could spend more time on each of these conservation practices, but I would like to spend time on the latest thing we're doing, which has proven itself well in protecting the soil from erosion. As I love to experiment with new things, I will call it dual crop, dual cover crop. These pictures help explain it. We put a dryland variety of alfalfa in 36 inch rows. You, you can see the winter wheat because it's green. The alfalfa is dormant. And so it is the light colored uh, stick sticking up. It's interseeded with a dryland variety of fall grain on a steep north slope of about seven to eight, eight acres to experiment with where it would get more winter snow to use for summer moisture. This dual crop cover crop hasn't had a chance to prove itself financially yet because of a year getting established and the second year being a drought year. Time will tell if it proves to be feasible. So what do I expect from this new practice when we get to a normal moisture year? I, number one, I expect it to eliminate soil erosion, which has already proven itself, especially on steep slopes. Envision all of the roots from the alfalfa and the wheat, big and small, going down, poking holes in the soil so that the water can percolate down. Number two, I expect the alfalfa to generate nitrogen for the fall wheat crop along with building the soil in fertility and porosity. Number three, I expect the wheat crop to help the alfalfa seed crop stand up. 
for an easier harvest on the stump or swathe, cured and harvested. I will need to separate the two crops, which will be easy with a grain cleaner because of the difference in seed size and kernel weight. Number five, theoretically produce a profit annually. This is yet to be seen. It will be the deciding factor to continue or not, but there is an alternative option. It could be a forage crop. I love to experiment with new ideas and sometimes they even work. I love to farm and don't plan on retiring anytime soon. After all, I'm only 81 and I have found one good thing about old age. The tractors go as fast for me as the young guys. Thanks for listening. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Cleve, for, for joining us today. That's a you've got a lot of fantastic I ideas out there on the ground. I I'm I and I think everyone else here is really, really impressed with uh with everything you've done and, and tried. Um so that's that's fantastic. Um, so hey, this is the Cleve was the last in the line of presenters today, and uh, we've got uh, time for um, the question and answer uh, session. And I thought I might kick kick this off by just posing a question to to our uh, presenters, and well, and maybe anyone else out there that's uh, been involved with uh, incorporating soil health practices on their operation. And uh, the the question I have for you is, um, what was the biggest uh, obstacle in your path to get to get started with the soil health practices that you're you're using now? Well, since I went first, I'll answer first. <clears throat> um, I think one of our biggest obstacles was residue management behind the combine. It it hurt our barley yield from the bean residue last year. And it also, it hurt the cover crop emergence with the barley residue this summer. Um, residue management is key behind the combine. Um, stripper headers, I think would be a great tool as is just a newer combine if you can afford it. <laughs> stripper headers, we've heard about that and we might have in our our next one of these uh tentative for january 27th we might we might have someone come on to talk to us about uh using using stripper headers it's interesting you mentioned that yeah i've ran a couple of them in colorado for a few summers on a relative's farm and they are fabulous awesome um and uh Justin had mentioned um, on his operation uh, how much there's, you know, his, his obviously his soil is being held down. He's using less fuel and, and, and manpower and tractor time. Um, but people always talk, or uh, I hear people talk about a, uh, a, a yield hit. I was curious about, uh, Justin, how, uh, if that was significant for you in your first couple of years um what that looks like now maybe you could share a little bit more on that yeah sure so uh we did we did see a little yield drop uh the first couple of years just simply because uh we're back to back to brad's residue management we we had to figure out how to deal with all the extra residue uh and uh but once we did that we're right back where we were before you know i mean we're we're there and then a little bit better even, you know? And uh, so I just ran my yield results. I had the five years previous and the five years uh, since that, that transition. And we've, uh, we've increased about a, about a bushel on the average. And, and that's kind of counting one of those years we had kind of a rough year cause we got started kind of late and froze pretty bad. But uh, you know, all in all, I, I figured that was a pretty good Pretty good roll average there with it. But yeah. So with, with your 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 labor reduction in labor fuel and and track tractor time and your 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 yields are uh, where where you want them, not really being a yield hit at all. Now that's that's got to uh, be making a really handsome difference on the bottom line. So it it really does. 
It really does, you know, and especially, you know, like the other day I was pricing fuel. We're, we're right, you know, just shy of three bucks for, for farm diesel. And uh, if I can get by with using half the fuel, it's, it's still expensive, but it's, it's only half the cost it'll be for 2022. Do you, are there other people in your area kind of following your lead uh, and, and adopting no-till? <laughs> Funny you should ask. Uh, I see I see Brad over here shaking his head like crazy because he knows my area. There there are a few here. Um, I, I will share the fun, this one little story with you. I've got a I've got a neighbor that uh, for the for the last several years when we first started, he kind of kept uh, poking me pretty hard about that. He says, you know, you need to just get a disc and get it all done and clean up that mess. And, and uh, after I did that a few years, you know, the first couple of years, uh, by year three, he came up to me and he said, uh, we're taking out a field of hay behind my landlord. And he has nothing but beachfront from the pivot all the way to the guy's house. He said, can you no-till that for me? And uh, so I did. And that, that fall, I asked him, I said, so how did it look? And he said, it was, it was a beautiful crop of wheat, probably one of the better ones we pulled. And uh, he says it was so easy to grow because we didn't have to replant it like we normally would. And he says, not only that, my landlord is totally pleased that we didn't fill his yard full of sand. So, um, so there, there are people that they're watching, they're adopting. I've got a, I've got a friend out uh, about 30 miles to the Northwest of me. They're in kind of heavier soils. And, uh, you know, we planted almost a thousand acres for him just last spring. Um, he's we've been out to his place about three three years now and uh, he's he's really adapted to that pretty quick his only question is, is can you get more acres in for me so yeah. <laughs> so he's just he's adding them as he's adding no-till acres as 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 much as he can now he, he is you know and he's he's kind of in in heavier soil type it's it's more of a clay loam with some gravel and so water water for him is a big thing also He's not looking at the soil erosion so much as the just the water retention, and uh, he said, you know, they with them put doing the no-till program, you know, it's it's kind of like I believe it was it was Cooper that talked about that cold soil type and how you how you have that mass over the top. You also don't lose the moisture to the wind or to the to the sunshine so much, you know. And so they could get a crop sprouted without without having to turn the pumps on. And uh, out there, those guys are pulling water probably seven eight hundred feet from the from the aquifer. So it's a long ways to water, and it's expensive to pull it. So they're they're saving a lot of money that way. Yeah, seven seven hundred feet lift is a big deal. Um, you know, to, to put it in perspective here. Last spring, I was I was starting some pivots, you know, and the it, the crop was up, and you know it was it was early summer, and on my farm, I have seven wells, and you know that feeds that feeds all my farm. When you figure it out by uh, CFS, we're pull when everything's running, we're pulling about twenty one and a half CFS of water out of the ground, which is a pretty good stream of water. And I look around from, I live on a little bit of a hill. You can look around and see all the pivot lights running around the neighborhood here. And you could probably stand here and count at least a hundred of them. And they're all pulling kind of the same thousand gallons a minute on most of them. So when you start doing the math, it's a huge, huge savings to the aquifer and to, to the farmer themselves, you know? So as a, as a water, short water uh, system that we have, um, I figure it's a it's a win win for both of us on the on my pocketbook and then on the just on the environment that we don't we don't have to pull that water and use it. Absolutely. Do you know Justin roughly how much water you've saved over over the summer? Um, I you know we're probably I don't know I I'd kind of be guessing here but. You know, we're probably running, we're saving probably at least three to four inches of water of, of what I've kept track of. Um, it's really hard to, to quantify how much water you pump 
every spring trying to hold down sand. Uh, I've, I have, you know, we, we've adapted no-till, but we also have potatoes in our rotation. We've got a neighbor that, that grows potatoes. And so we've slowly worked them around the field just for some rotation. Um, we, we tra there's two kind of transition points there. We were looking to find something that we could grow to rotate with grain and the mustard's kind of fill in that niche. So we're, we're working the mustard more into our, our program, but, but uh, you know, we water, we water. Um, I, I'll pose the question, I'll pose the answer this way. Have you ever seen water ponding and standing on sand soil? <laughs> That's the way it gets around here in the spring of the year. Um, you'll see big ponds out in the sand. It won't go down because it's totally saturated. And yet when the wind forecast comes up, the, water, the pivots are still running just because you can't hold, you can't hold sand very long because the minute it dries out, it starts moving and cutting things off. Um, so I always figure if I can hold the top eighth of an inch, I can hold the next 10 feet. But if I can't hold that top eight, it's it's game over and it's moving. You know, uh, the one pivot, the the one slide that I presented at the last that had the you can see that was just the green grass with the blowing sand in the background. We were that year we were planting that field. Uh, we had watered. We always pre-water our sand open ground to try to clot it up a little bit while we're planting. And uh, that particular pivot had been by two hours before that photo had been taken. <laughs> so two hours and the sand was still blowing like that. So it just does not hold up. It, it goes. Man. That is amazing. Um, hey, uh, not to change the subject too abruptly, but I noticed there was a question here in the comments that I didn't. I, really didn't notice until now it's for 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 tyson on the on the compost extract and and are, are you using that as a seed coating so we tried that one time on a cover crop application since it was easy but we find that handling the seed is a challenge uh, when you start talking about a couple tons of seed or something to get it spread out and apply the liquid and then get it dried and then re put it back in a container or get it in the drill. It's just more of a challenge to handle. We find that using the liquid in furrow is just simpler and more straightforward for us. So no real advantage with the, you think with the seed, just a lot more complication. Yeah, it's just, for us, it was just harder to handle. We already kind of had the, the liquid handling equipment from using conventional fertilizers. So to start handling all this seed, we just weren't set up for it. Just became more of a chore than it was worth. And we saw the pictures of those, the seedlings and the, the, the difference uh, between the uh, kind of the next door field and then the, the ones of yours that had um, been planted with the, uh, with the extract. And um, tell us a story about after the seedling what was the you know what was that crop like and what or is it just an advantage for getting the seed established or do you think there's an, a, an advantage for for plant vigor and yield um you know right up to right up to harvest so the biggest advantage we're seeing right now is the first especially on a corn crop is the first couple months of growth up to that corn's maybe knee high something like that but it doesn't seem to matter what the weather is, if it's hot, dry, cold, wet, whatever. We seem to get a great stand that everything germinates pretty evenly, comes emerges fairly uniform. So we just feel like as far as setting the crop up early on a strong, strong start, um, this compost extract is certainly helping with that helping getting those feeder roots established, getting good root mass under it. The crop just comes up pretty quick, no matter what the conditions and really gets off and rolling. Um, and then as far as yields go, we've had some issues kind of in our mid season management with different things. So our yields are, haven't changed much really, um, but we figure that's not really on account of our early season applications. It's figuring out what to do in the summer and even into the fall. 
Well, and if those plants are getting a better start, are, your, are there less inputs um, involved through the season to get them to harvest, I guess? So that's another thing we've, on account of another project, we're testing some nitrogen products for an outfit, and we've really started to try and wean ourselves off of quite a lot of fertilizer. Um, we've got, a, we're going on about half the farm now that we're able to produce good crops on almost no synthetic fertilizers. Um, we're still using strong applications of some micros that get tied up in our high, high pH soils. But as far as NPK, the big ones were pretty well weaned off on quite a few acres. Wow, that's impressive. Well, I feel like I'm asking all the questions here. I don't mean to be a, a conversation hog. Somebody, please, please, please chime in. Um, go, go ahead. So hey, just this is, answer. This is. Go ahead, Tyson. Uh, just to answer Marlon's questions. He's asking if I've done a PF, PFLA test on my fields and. No, at this point, we have not done any Haney tests or PFLA or any of those microbial tests. We're just, we've done a few synthetic tests, you know, the standard soil tests, and then uh, just kind of based on our soil health, based on what we can steal in our fingers and what we see every day. Well, I'll, I'll break the awkward silence. I had a question written down for Cooper. How many varieties have you gone through and how many are on the list to try? You're asking about how many dry bean varieties we're willing to tolerate before we give up? Well, <laughs> I don't know if that's the exact question, but the, uh, the uh, graphic there with the, the pivot and all the different colored strips in there seemed to imply, that, I guess that's what I was looking at was a, a a lot of different varieties on that on that chunk of ground and it just led to the I jotted down that question like well how many I wonder how many they've done and how many they're, they're willing to do yeah we're we're kind of glutton for punishment on this a little bit um you know I did talk about just four pinnel varieties but this year we also planted three garden bean varieties uh Jacob's cattle uh which is a dry bean sort of heirloom bean uh provider bean and and maxi bell Filet, filet bean that are green beans um, that we grow for garden bean seed in our conventionally tilled program. So we wanted to throw those in there for, for a look and see what happened. We were able to, to get some yield off of those other garden beans, um, those three varieties of garden beans in addition to the, the pintos. I don't have that data yet uh, sorted out. I haven't, don't have the clean weights or, or even the dirt weights on those. Um, it wasn't very pleasing, but it still, you know, it, we did learn something there. Um, yeah, I mean, we have Quite a, quite a list, as I said, you know, any short season edible you know, dry bean that we think will tolerate uh, our situation and she's shown we're, we're aiming to try. So we've got a few more on the list to get through. Part of it is just getting seeds, sometimes uh, actually obtaining access to these seeds because sometimes they're sort of tightly held um, seed for export out of Idaho. And so sort of got to get in line early and, and get on the list to get a few hundred pounds before it all gets shipped out of state. And so that's that's also sort of why we're considering how to develop a breeding program to improve varieties that would be well suited to these conditions. Um, that, that was sort of our original intent, but um, we think we need to, to give it a good try just grabbing off the shelf stuff to see if something will work tolerably, tolerably well you know, going forward. But uh, to expand on your question to um, also the cover crops, you know, there are four other varieties of, of winter rye, winter cereal rye, that we think we need to try as well. Um, the current variety we're using is, um, oh, Elbon, it's called, which is kind of an old variety. And we're wondering if, you know, it's been out for so many years and it's been grown everywhere that it may have strayed from its original breeding and therefore has a sort of a range of um, maturity dates and, and its susceptibility to crimping may May not be great. What you know to kill with a crimper, you need the whole field to be at the exact same reproductive stage, and all at the right moment, sort of in the the milk or soft dough stage, and then you kill it by crimping and crushing it. So if you've got plants that are ahead or behind that stage, you may not kill them, um, or you end up with viable seed. 
uh, for, for plants that have already matured. So there's three other, four other varieties that we want to try to add into the mix. Uh, the most promising of which is ND Gardener, which is a new, new release from North Dakota, which uh, the word on the street might, might, be, might be better for us. But we're also, as I say, trying this spelt, um, winter spelt, which we have access to now from uh, one of our uh, partners. And that leads me to a question I actually had for, for Mary. Uh, thank you for your cover crop work. Um, I was curious, you know, I saw some chatting there with about termination and cold hardiness. You know, we really need to find an oat, a winter hardy oat that works in our region. In our experience, oats just don't make it through very well. So I was pleased to see your work and I'd like to encourage you to keep, keep trying for other cereals besides the sort of standard triticale winter wheat uh, rye options, because we, we need a bigger toolkit, I think, for cold season stuff. I'm seeing some questions here pop up. Um, so Tyson's asking, uh, do we own our own roller crimper? We had a roller crimper built at our local machine shop. Uh, the first year we tried this, and cost us a couple, you know, Cost us some time and money, but it was well worth doing. They are available sort of off the shelf from several companies on the East Coast. Um, you know, what is it called? Croproller.com or something. Um, I and J crop rollers. We follow the designs that are available from the Rodale Institute for free online. And our machine shop guys were super excited about building this. And we, they tried to build it for us a couple of years ago and we kind of balked. And in the end, at the last minute, when we decided we really needed it, within a few weeks, we pulled the trigger and they got it done. It looks great. Um, there's actually a video probably buried in some of the links that were shared at the beginning of this session on some of this uh, work we did in previous year in 2019, and we have a more explanation of the crimper there. Ours is a 15 foot wide, three point mounted uh, unit. And Nick looks like he's asking a question. Dry mat pros and cons related to soil moisture for the beans, net positive. I remember there was some question about whether the mat was holding the moisture to some degree and potentially delaying infiltration. Yeah, we're not, uh, not quite sure how to answer that yet. Um, I think it is the case that, you know, a thick organic mat preserves moisture that you have uh, stored over the winter, you know, going into springtime. But when you have thirsty crops in the heat of the summer and you have a thick organic mat on top of the ground, you know, the, I guess we, we reminded ourselves or relearned that that thick organic mat can intercept and sort of delay irrigation water getting into the root zone. So it may be that instead of running your pivot around all the time at a half an inch, you know, keeping your bare ground sort of adequately um, wet. In our case, we need to run the pivot around less frequently, but at a higher rate so that we fully saturate the thick, you know, one inch thick mat of crimped rye get that water into the soil profile and get it to penetrate down into the root zone. And in extreme heat, you know, it's just hard sometimes these past few summers to keep, keep crops wet enough. So that, that is a bit of a challenge. That, that. It, it, the real issue I think on the mat is that it, it, as I said, it just keeps things kind of cool. And so if you're planting a seed or a crop that's not used to germinating in cool soil, you, you may have some challenges. And that's certainly our, our experience. Hey Cooper, I wonder about the uh, kind of the flip side with the really um, hot summer temperatures. Um, did you did you see where were your beans doing well and others maybe had, had slowed down a little bit in the in the real high heat? Well, I, it's hard to say. Some of that is just about timing and what this plant growth stage is at when those you know hot spells hit. Um, we're planting these no-till beans a little bit later than our conventionally tilled, you know, sort of bare ground beans. And so they were just at a, a different point. And so they didn't express stress in the same way that a neighboring field did on those hot 100 degree days. Um, I think, you know, as I alluded to, once we got, once we figured out we were a little deficient in some areas of the field and soil moisture, and we got that water up where it needed to be, everything was, you know, a little better. But Actually, that picture I showed where Nicholas and Brad are out sampling, um, that day was one in particular where we noticed a lot of stress. We just come off a few days of, of sort of overcast or monsoon conditions, 
and uh, it wasn't that hot. We had a lot of high smoke from California. And then that day they came out, it got hot super fast and right away the beans showed stress. Um, so I, I think it, it just, it doesn't let you off the hook for being a good manager, a good observer and keeping track of what, what's going on underneath the canopy. But I think there is potential there to reduce the stress on the beans. Yeah, and you, you'd you mentioned this uh, business with, with oats and the, and the PMC. And I meant to, before we get off of here to ask Mary where people can find, um, if she could tell us where people can find more information from the from the PMC, their published tech notes and, and when the, uh, where to find the information on these studies when they come out. Oh, maybe we lost, maybe we lost Mary. I know it's getting a little bit late and we're, I know folks are trying to get on to other stuff. No, I'm, I'm here. I think I didn't unmute right, but um, I'll drop that into the chat. I'll drop the link into the chat. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, and speaking of folks dropping off before we lose uh, Linda Schott, Dr. Linda Schott from the University of Idaho. I just want to publicly thank her very much for hosting the Zoom link and helping out on these. Um, Linda's just fantastic to work with and I can't thank her enough for helping us make these happen. Um, and did any of the presenters have anything they wanted to, they, they wanted to expound on, but felt constrained by the time limits? Um, anything else they wanted to add? I just wanna thank Steve Schuyler for his help on the demo farm this summer as well. I saw he put a note on here that all of our presenters are, are rock stars. I would agree with that. Um, and, and I would say that he being the proponent that he is of soil health practices and conservation is qualifies in that category as well. So. Sean, I'd, I'd just like to add, uh, if anybody, if, if you guys have questions outside of this and you want to talk to me about it, you're more than welcome to call me or or uh, drop me an email either way. You know, I'm I'm an open book. I don't I don't share. I mean, I share everything. I don't I don't hold back. So if you want, if you have more detailed questions, sure enough, hit me up. Okay, you bet. And that's that's Place Farms, and folks can just find you by looking that up. Yeah, yeah. Just look me up, Place Farms. Look me up. If they got Insta, uh, they can hit me up on Instagram, Farmer Justin Place. Um, okay. Anyway, or Facebook, just just in place. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I'm sure folks really, really appreciate it. Um, excellent work being done out in your part of the world, for sure. Um, does anybody else have any other comments? Uh, I figure we're just about 1030. We should probably wrap up and let everyone get on about their, their regular business. I just wanted to kind of echo Justin's sentiments. Um, all these topics, no-till, compost, whatever, I just love talking about. So if anybody has any ideas they want to run past me or talk about anything in general, feel free to look me up. I would thoroughly enjoy it. And I see uh, Cameron left a question in the chat asking if I tried other compost methods before starting with, doc with the Johnson Sue method. And I didn't specifically, I was looking into some, um, and they're just more management than I was up to handling as far as monitoring the piles and stirring them and things like that. So I looked into it, but I found this method to be more suited to our management capabilities. So that's why I kind of ran with it. There was a lot hey, of them out there when I was out there. How many, how many of those pallets do you have going at any one time now? Uh, you saw us at our peak. I think we had six at that time. We've cut back to about three. Um, okay. Just, just based on the acres that we're putting them on, we don't need quite so much at any one time. Hey, this is Cooper. I, I see Neil's jumped on. He might want to say something, but I want to jump in ahead of him. Um, Sean, to answer your question that you posed right out of the gate and which, uh, Brad answered by saying stubble or, you know, residue management was a challenge. I think for me and a lot of other folks, the biggest challenge to adopting any of this is fear. And so to the extent that, you know, you can reach out to Tyson, 
you know, you can reach out to, to Justin or attend these webinars and, and ask your neighbor who's doing it or, or ask someone in your region or out of state even how to do it and how to apply it to your system to make it work so that you have some success the first year and you can overcome that fear barrier. That's been crucial for us. You know, we've not done everything right out of the gate. We've had a lot of challenges. We continue to have challenges, but we have a, you know, we're overcoming that fear barrier by talking with you all and trying to establish relationships with everyone and, and sharing and being that open book as, as we're talking about here, as Justin just said. So thanks everyone. Really appreciate that uh, willingness to work together. Yeah. And, and uh, kind of building on that, thanks for teaming that up, Cooper. I just want to jump on and say, you know, thank you to Sean and, and Linda for organizing this and all the speakers. You know, I think the information sharing is, is a huge part of it. And I think for, folks to be able to see, you know, what, what others are doing, what's working, what's not, uh, is, is hugely important. And I think, uh, as you said, Cooper, it will help with some of that fear and, and trying some of these new practices. So thanks. Thanks to everyone. Uh, to actually back up Neil again with the information sharing, Tyson, could you share the name of that forum that you moderate online so we can maybe build up some traffic on that? I think it's a great way to share information. Sure, that's good thinking, Brad. Um, yeah, so I run a, a, a text forum similar to this where everybody can share their pictures and stories. I'm trying to focus mostly on the Treasure Valley, but anybody's welcome to read and share their experiences, but I'll put the link in the uh, comments over there. Okay. Well, this has been a really, a really good discussion and a great group of presenters. And I know folks have, have thanked me for, for putting these things together, but really it's the presenters that, that, that make it happen and the, the, the discussion and their willingness to, to be a part of this. And like Cooper said, overcoming a, a fear of trying something new. And, um, and so hats off to all the presenters. Can't thank, can't thank everyone enough. Um, really, really appreciate your participation. You know, we've got a tentatively uh, January 27th for another one of these. I've got several people that are already uh, willing to uh, present and talk to us. Um, so that's shaping up really well. And I, I hope you will continue to uh, keep your antenna up for these announcements of, of, of these events and, and, and tune in and be part of the conversation. Really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, thank you again, and uh, unless there's any last comments, I, I think we'll, we'll wrap it for the day. Okay, well, hearing none, I think we're, uh, we're out of here for the day. Um, happy holidays to everyone. If you're traveling, travel safe, and uh, good cheer to everyone out there. All right. Thanks again.